Terry Woolman on Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi, Vicki. Hi. Record. Okay, was, by who? My, Whom? my radio promo people. I was going to say, not your mother. Not my <laughs> mother. My mother. She would have loved the record, though. If, <laughs> okay. she, was, if she was alive, like I think voice. she would have resisted and then fallen in love with it because the music is timeless. How can you, first of all, how can anybody not like Christmas music? Yeah. I mean, it's just not possible. It's it's really, what I discovered from making this record is it's, it's so much a part of our human culture. Mm -hmm. Not just American, but worldwide. These Absolutely. songs, because they're jazz standards. You know, they're, they're really, they're Are classic. They? They really, they have the essence of, you know, to me they hold up like the Great American Songbook. They're really well-written songs. They're they like amazing melodies, great lyrics. And even though some of these I did as instrumental arrangements, they're, they're I, you know what I had in front of me on the music stand when I was what? recording? 
the lyrics, not the music. I was reading the lyrics as I was playing the melody and letting it I, kind of propel okay. the... I love that because music really is an expression of the feeling, right? Yeah, absolutely. Of the thought and the yeah, feeling. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think we can feel things just with music that things that don't have... Obviously, you do a lot of instrumental stuff. Yeah. But... But I work with singers all the time as well. So. And going through the lyric is like really expressing what the songwriter intended. I th yeah, I think it's more like a more of an acting approach. Yeah, like like you've so. got a backstory to the song before you walk into the scene. So. I kind of love that a lot. I love that a lot. That's fabulous. Um, welcome Terry Woolman, who's Thank now you. healthy. Yes. Okay, because we tried to have Terry on about a month ago. Yeah. And um. That that brutal that, beastly that yeah, mega f bug flu. And not a flu. flu. It wasn't we, we, flu. We agreed that just because you're was, sniffling does yeah. not mean you have the flu. And it was it was a really bad cold, and I just I felt so bad about letting all of you and, and you guys here, Vicky. So yeah. let down. But we, um, were, we were so let down. But I got <laughs> so <laughs> sick. It was incredible. And I never get sick. That's you know, incredible. I'm like I just thrive. You know, I really work on being healthy. Okay, now speaking of being healthy, yeah. I just saw but, that. But just to yeah, answer your question, yeah, oh yeah, it, was, it was Jason Goroff, Goroff Music. They do my radio promo. Uh -huh. And I was on the radio with, um, I had this hit instrumental tune that I wrote with Kev Mo. Yes. It called Mandela. And it had been on the charts for like six months on the Billboard charts. It was fantastic. Can you, can you give us a little taste? Uh, yeah, I could. All right. Oh, we need a track. No, we don't. Oh, we don't need a track. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Percussion, you know, I was wow. we did all kinds of stuff, and I played a little, this little tiny flute, and it was just great. All these textures, it was on the radio, it was doing great. And Goroff Music, who are these wonderful radio promoters, mm -hmm. uh, they basically said, you know, Christmas is coming, and they're gonna quit playing your song oh. because they only play Christmas music. So it might be the, a nice gesture. You know, uh, to radio, like just to to the radio people, just to give them a Christmas song to play. That makes so much sense over the holidays. So and so he said, if you want to do that, it'd be a nice idea. So I recorded three songs instead of one, uh -huh. just because it's it's more cost effective, and, right. and and I wanted to make sure that I got it right because I never really thought about doing a Christmas record. I gave it a lot of thought, went in, and I, and I had three ideas, so I just did all three, and we ended up. You know, releasing them, Little Drummer Boy, which I just played for mm -hmm. you, became a single. See, now I always thought that was Pahrumpa Pum Pum. Yeah, I, 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 I forget that it's a right. Little Drummer Boy. Right. I, I know that, but it's Pahrumpa Pum Pum. So they played, actually, they played all three songs, but the, 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 the single actually was Little Drummer Boy. And then after the holidays were over, they started playing Mandela again. Nice. So I stayed on the charts for like about eight months with that song. It was amazing. Well, that's very so that's, savvy. And then I thought, I was thinking about doing my next record, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, three songs, I'm a third of the way into an album. So I wonder if I should make a Christmas record, and I thought about it, and I'm like, this would be kind of cool. I think that, yeah. aside from Adam Sandler, I, I want to know how <laughs> many Jews make Christmas records. Right. There's probably, I, I mean, there, yeah, there's probably a lot of Jews making Christmas records. Well, and, okay. and a lot of them wrote the songs. You know, Mel yeah. Torme wrote the Christmas song. Stop. Yeah. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Mel Torme. Is that so? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think a Steve Albert plays summer. with Mel Torme's son. What's Mel Torme's son's name? Uh, he's got uh, well, Steve March and then um, James Torme. I, I think it's Steve March yeah. that Steve Rollins plays with, and, and I think uh, we're Facebook friends, actually. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't And they're both really talented. And series. I did not know this. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and most Christmas songs and Christmas albums get written and recorded in the summer when it's just hot as... That's, that's yeah. also yeah. bizarre. It's funny, so, you know. Right, you, you have to record it, obviously, before the season. Yeah, you've got to get, get it out. It out so does it, okay, so if, when you're recording a Christmas song in the middle of the summer, do you get in the spirit? Well, as much as you can as grown up Jewish. Yeah, but so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I get into the spirit of the music. I, I, you know, I, whenever I am arranging, producing, even mm -hmm. writing, um, because I wrote a little bit for the record also, but 
but mostly I wanted to do like these classics and put my own spin on them. Right. Um, I just lose myself in the music. I just, I, it's like going on a treasure hunt for what's special about the song, the melody, the lyric, the point of view. When I work with the singer, finding the right key, finding the this right This is template. so important. We have a lot of uh, musicians, singers, songwriters, yeah. uh, composers listening to the show. I, I love this take on it. Um, I think Graf is here and she mm -hmm. was talking about, she has a, a workshop called Make This On Your Own. Right. And that's really what you're talking about, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, you find, you find your place in it mm -hmm. and you look for the magic. I love that. Yeah. So, okay. so that puts me in the spirit of, I also, the, the spirit of the holidays and what I was right. doing, but I also, at the time, I had a studio that was separate from my house. Mm -hmm. It was, I had double doors. It was like, you go in there and it was just sort of this. Could get lost. Totally. Mm -hmm. Whatever I was doing, I could get lost in there. I just would just dis disappear in there for hours and create. That's a really cool thing. Yeah. I, I was just, um, by the way, when I look down and I'm, I'm doing things, it's because I'm, I'm not not paying attention to you. I'm trying to make sure we're there. I'm seeing we're looking really blurry. I don't know if we look blurry at home, but tell us if we, we don't. Okay, good, because we'll know. You can't tell from my phone because they're... So oh, right into us because we're so right in, we are watching. But I see that Roy... Um, Hi, everybody. My He's friend... <laughs> my friend... Roy is watching, and I he helped me make, I made cabbage soup. Do you know sweet and sour cabbage soup? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I made this week for the first time sweet and sour cabbage soup because I was craving it like yeah. crazy. And it was You've like been thrown down in the kitchen all it's like starting around Thanksgiving. I've been I haven't, following you. I, I have been thrown <laughs> down. I have been thrown down. So I, I like spent like eight hours making cabbage soup right. the other night. And you know, when you first make something like that, it doesn't taste great. The next oh, day it tastes better. Yes. But then two days later, that's oh my the, God. That's when the magic happens. I'm telling you, yeah. it's like that's when the magic happens. And so also I want to acknowledge for the, because I missed everything today because I was readying, yeah. but um, we have, uh, we have in one form or another, an impeached president. Yes. And I I'm just sorry, heard that on the way over. But this is, this is, um, Okay, it might not mean anything in the large scale. It means something. It means it means. It means it, we're following what's important in the Constitution. And it it's it, even if and I don't want to say speak negatively. I think we yeah. have the power to make this really stick and to do big things. Mm -hmm. I, I have to believe that. Yeah. But um, there were a lot of people um, who were out marching yesterday, mm -hmm. and I, I'm ashamed that I was with Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio yesterday <laughs> instead. I have shame over that, but I don't I've know never heard shame in those I, two gentlemen the same. I have shame with sentence. Brad Pitt and Leonardo, but, but not a lot of guilt because it was yeah. Brad Pitt and Leonardo. No, yeah. I, I'm sorry that I wasn't out marching yesterday. Yeah. Were you an activist back in the day? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I was too. So, yeah. were, were you like marching on Washington and doing all that stuff? Yeah, yes. I was. I mean, I I was doing work for the Hunger Project when I was in high school because my music teacher Sam Harris, not the singer Sam Harris, but Sam Harris, became this huge activist and started this group Results, and he st he still works in uh, D.C. as an activist. He became a political activist. I so, would love that. You know, for world hunger, for for uh, democracy now, just for everybody, regardless of. Republican, Democrat, be involved. Speak your voice. You I, know, I, you know, and, and, and listen, like dialogue. So important, and, and there were so people. many years of apathy. Yes. You know, between the sixties, the sixties and seventies were unbelievable, and then like the eighties and nineties were like this lame time. Right, but we came up. I came up. I don't throw you under the bus with you know, because um, I have no idea how old you are. I'm sixty four. Okay, so we're the same age. Yeah, I'm sixty three. Okay. Well, oh. Yeah. So, so we, but we came up, there was the, the Vietnam War was going on, mm -hmm. Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin were... Civil were, rights were still a huge issue. Yeah. They, were trying, they were trying to take anything, the African-American literature out of the... I was... Yes. Racism in the schools, you know, I was marching for that. There right. was all kinds of stuff going on. So, yeah, I, I grew up mm -hmm. um, socially active. Yes. This was very important. So today is a is a monumental day. Really no matter was. what happens from this, this is monumental. Yeah. Because... He can no longer sit in his prideful place in that, he'll never sit in that prideful place ever again in the same way after what happened today. Mm -hmm. And I, that, was, that in itself is a huge victory. It's powerful. It's and it's it's, it's not it's, nearly as enough um, enough of a victory. Sorry. No, no, and and it's such a it's an odd time. Like we, it's it's a place in our in our political system that I, I believe we've never been in before. And and I'm all for outside of the box or there is no box anymore. And and 
even the idea of having a businessman run our country as a business, I think is really cool, but, but I would prefer it would be a socially responsible um, a, a businessman with high morals. I think Personally, you, I, that's I, I, I think stand. that's what, what is that called when you have a, a, an oxymoron? Yes, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's exactly what that is. It's a businessman with high morals. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, no, I'm not looking for a businessman. Yeah. But I'm, I'm uh, but I remember but, when Ross Perot ran? I thought it was kind of a wacky idea, but it was. I mean, I tilted. I thought well, that's an interesting way. Yeah, I, I lean way to the left. Yeah. Now, so I have trouble with Ross Perot. Perot. Yeah. I have trouble with that, but. But that's okay. But anyway, um, big news in, in our world. Ding dong, the witch is not quite dead, <laughs> but uh, stamped on a, a bit, which is really good. You know, also I wanted to talk to you, Terry, before yeah. we get into you, because we, we, you started to say when you were a kid, and we'll, we'll talk about where mm -hmm. that was. But, um, so I was bitten by a spider on Monday. Yeah. And then you told me your spider stories. Yeah. So I, I would show you mine, but it doesn't look dramatic today. And yeah. I showed you the picture. It the looked, it picture looked, is pretty radical. It was, it was pretty gross. I didn't post it because it was really pretty disgusting. But so yeah. tell me tell me your, your spider bite story because everybody on Facebook has I spider I have two stories. spider bite oh, that's stories so too, which is wacky because, and, and I never talk about it, but, but as soon as I saw that you got bit and it might be a brown green clips, I thought, this is serious. Okay, so did it happen in LA? One happened in LA, the other happened in Arizona when I was performing out there. The Arizona one was I went to a Native American sweat lodge. Well, you know, I was invited, and I thought, well, that would be really cool. Where and in Arizona? I went to school. I believe in it was in Tucson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you study? Acting? Drama. Yeah. I'm a drama teacher. Yeah, great. <laughs> of course. Uh, so, but I did this thing. I didn't feel a bite or anything mm -hmm. um, because it's a thousand degrees in a sweat lodge. And, right. And oh, so you didn't feel the bite? No, I didn't feel it when it happened, and then. I went to this performance later that night and I started like breaking out and I was swollen and, and then I saw that I had a puncture mark and I, there was a nurse there and they gave me some antihistamine or something. I went to the ER, I think. And then, you know, was well enough to like do the performance, flew home the next day and had to go to the emergency room. And what, um, cause Brown Rick was, it, 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 yeah, it turned out, it was a, well, they, they knocked it out with medication and then and it was pretty bad. I mean, like I saw, I was with some friends and family and they go, you don't look good. You know, cause I, I just, I'm like that guy, you just kind of tough it out and I'm not believing. And it's like, yeah. I guess I'm okay. And it's like, you need to go to the hospital. So I went and, yeah. and uh, they took care of me. They maybe, I think they gave me a shot of Benadryl or something. It was right. a long time ago. Uh -huh. And then like years later, I was just- So wait, did you not get, you didn't have a scar, you didn't have like, no, it went away. I okay. mean, it was nasty looking because for a while. Because they treated it right, right away. away. And, and okay. pretty forcefully. A couple years later, I, I was... The, is the, is the, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I um, ended up dog sitting for my cousin uh -oh, and slept right. at his house. <laughs> yes. And I felt that bite and I got bit by a, a brown recluse Okay, again. what are the odds of that? You would think I should have bought a lottery ticket or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It was so odd and weird. And my cousin, Glenn, was an ER doctor. So I mm -hmm. called him up and he said, come to the ER. They treated me aggressively. And I still, I got bit on the hand. I forget which hand. But I had to go. Did you find the spider? Did you know it was? Did, did you just know from the bite that it was a brown recluse? No. Or did you see it? I didn't see it. They okay. they determined, okay. especially when, this, when it started getting infected and the skin was deteriorated. I had to go to a hand surgeon and they had to actually do surgery on my hand to cut out the skin or the, the tissue that was. How much after getting bit was that? Um, I think it was within a few days to a week. So I that, was, that probably saved you? Yeah. From having... Oh yeah. yeah. That's why I still have two hands. <laughs> I mean, but they, they had to cut away, you know, the infected tissue and everything. So it was kind of, that was gruesome. So. Um, that might have been the last, that was in a sweat lodge, but I haven't, I don't think I've been to a sweat lodge since. I'm kind of... I don't blame you. Yeah. Do you. Have you stopped dog sitting as well? Yeah. Ron. So <laughs> Ron is dog sitting I'm, right now. Ron I'll Frederick walk your doggy. Be, but, behind, the, uh, yeah. behind the camera. Thank you for, for doing no this. Bites. Thank you. No bites. Yeah. No bites. Yeah. No bites. But, you've, but still, you've still got a couple weeks of dog But I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't believe that we both share, you know, bad spider bite stories. Okay, so, well, mine, rare. yours is bad. But so some, sure. my friend Dennis got, uh, got on there. He was bit by a black widow. <laughs> and so he went into the ER and they said to him, if he had not come in that night, he would have, he could have lost his, he could have lost his 
his arm yeah. and then he could have died. Yeah. Black Widow, I guess. You're very toxic. So yeah. so when I got this, yeah. my son just happened to call right when it happened yes. and I was showing him on FaceTime and he said, meet me at the ER right now. Yeah. And you know, like I am not, I, I'm not the type that's going to do it. He's not the type that's going to say it. I didn't want to go. I had women who write, I, yeah. I canceled two women who write in 11 years right. and the first one's because my father passed away. So it takes a lot for me to do that. Yeah. And then I, but you know, at one o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting in the ER and I don't know what I've got or if it's going to get worse mm -hmm. or what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I have to make a decision. And I made a decision that I regretted at four o'clock in the morning. Well, you're still there. Because I'm, well, I know I got home at 3.30, Three, but I'm okay. thinking, okay, I could stay up the rest of the night, get it set up and be got ready. It. And I, I wouldn't have had to disappoint everybody. You but, did the right thing in taking care of yourself. And I'm really glad you did that. Uh, don't yeah. screw around with spider bites, though, yeah. because from what they were telling me, if a spider bite, this is what I learned mm -hmm. the other day, is if a spider bite gets progressively worse, mm -hmm. you're in trouble, you need help. Right. If it immediate, you know, like mine after an hour and a half started to get better. Mm -hmm. So and it's almost even, you know, it's really yeah, it's not, looking pretty good. Yeah, not bad at all yeah. now. So that's like the telltale sign of danger. Danger not to hear. Yeah. Okay, this has nothing to do with anything. And that concludes about. our medical <laughs> segment. <laughs> that concludes our spider bite segment. We've done the uh, the What else do we have soon. in common? We and we Jews play. Oh, we have so much in common. Yeah. Okay, so so Terry has worked with two Jewish men that I adore. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of Jews, but um, we have Paul Reiner in common. Yeah. Now, why do we have Paul Reiner in common? What did you do with Carl? I uh, I produced music for a movie that Carl hosted, uh, or was a big part of, um, with George Shapiro. That was yeah. I mean, Carl was basically the host. It was called "If You're Not Leo, Bit Eat Breakfast," and I and, produced. And who else is in that movie? Well, just alone. The, the I produced Dick Van Dyke, so Dick was in that movie. Um, Mel. Mel Torme. Mel Brooks. I, I mean, Mel Brooks. Yeah. Norman Lear. Norman was Lear. in it. Mm -hmm. um, Dick Van Dyke. We did Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke. Yes. Tony Bennett oh, was in it. So, so I, I got What's that non-Jew doing in that? Yeah. Movie? So I went to New York and produced Tony Bennett with, with Danny Gold. Who, what and, was that was like? Incredible. And absolutely mind-boggling. Tell us about working with Tony Bennett. And, and also Alan Bergen was the third person I produced with Dave Grusin. Oh, yeah, one yeah. of my heroes. Tell, tell so us, tell us about Bennett, working with Tony Bennett. Yeah. Um, working with Tony Bennett was kind of surreal. I mean, it was with all, with all of them. I've worked with a lot of celebrities, but it's still, yeah. you know, I was legend little, statuses. Yeah, and I and it was in New York. We did this one live in a in a club where we set up, you know, like a studio and everything. What, what club were you in? Uh, it was at a hotel and it was downstairs in the basement and I don't remember the name. Fifty four below. No, no, it wasn't. Okay. Um, it was not. It was not one of the typical places. Uh -huh. but it was a really cool looking place. Nice. Um, I can find out and we'll write it in. For, okay. You know, my Facebook. Okay. Later good, on. good. 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 Uh, but anyway, so but we used Tony's band on that. So I didn't play, but I co-arranged and co-produced the song with Dave Bennett, uh, his son, you know, who's his producer. And it was incredible because I was essentially there kind of conducting and helping. I wasn't actually sure how much or how, how much or how little I would need to do besides uh -huh. having done the arrangement. When you do the, the pre-production, when you prepare, right. the thing is to over-prepare mm -hmm. for any kind of a, a show. Uh -huh. And then just be present and see what's needed to be of service. So it turned out that I did more than I thought I would be doing, and it was really fun. So I got to, I went up, I was introduced to him, and once, he was, well, once, he was lovely. I mean, he's wearing a suit, he looks like, you know, a million dollars. He looks like Tony Bennett. He looks like Tony Bennett, and as soon as we talked and shook hands and said hi, and I said, all right, this is what we're gonna be doing, and let me know what you need, then it was like two musicians talking. And it became very comfortable. He was incredibly respectful, oh, nice. and, and it was, and he was incredibly amazing. You know? I love what you said about being of service. I'm a, I'm a twelve stepper, and mm -hmm. being of service, and being of service as a producer, being of service right. as a human, as a as a husband, as a whatever, all of that stuff. Uh, I think if everybody adapted that attitude of being of service. Mm -hmm. um, Things would go a lot better, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> I, I prefer to be around people that, that have that point of view. I, yeah, I love that. Okay, so, so, so and what was it like? Uh, to, you, we talked a little bit before the show. What's it like working with Dick Van Dyke? Uh, he, Dick Van Dyke is one of the kindest, sweetest, warmest people that I've ever met, mm -hmm. regardless of working or not working. Mm -hmm. He was a delight. It was an absolute pleasure. And the, the people in the band, 
uh, we're on camera. We recorded at Capitol and we recorded live. We filmed the whole thing. And we changed into like suit and tie and sort of did this video montage that was edited beautifully in the I movie. See yeah, by, mm -hmm. by Danny Golden, mm -hmm. and the director. And so we, um, it was kind of magical. Like all of these guys, these were superstar musicians like, because, you, you know, the best. It's the best of the best. Mm -hmm. They were in awe. Like they play, these guys have played with everybody and they were like, oh my God, this is Dick Van Dyke. And he, he sang super. Califragilistic for us, and you know, and then we played some things for him. And we, and he actually sang, we did like a little jazz standard for fun that he was singing along to. Dick's actually a really good singer in that he, he swings, he's like old school, I love it's that. like in his bones. So he like swang, he swung, swang, <laughs> <laughs> swinged, yeah, he swung. He, swung. Uh, he it, it was very deep groove that he went in, and it was wonderful because he had never really recorded at Capitol. And, it, you know, I really, did, yeah, it was like a new experience for him. So wow. it was like it was an amazing day, and it was a marathon day. You know, we did the whole thing, and and it was incredible. And then we needed to. You were, so you were in that Capitol Records building. You yeah, were, you were in that building. In that building, it's a really famous building in LA. If yeah, you anywhere else. It's incredible. You've seen it in movies and TV shows, and we were in Studio A, the big studio, and it's where Frank Sinatra recorded and Barbara Streisand and. Toto and like everybody. Nat right? King Cole. Nat King Cole, yeah. absolutely. It's yeah. just, it, every time I go there, I just can't believe my good fortune. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, and the people that run it, Paula Salvatore is an incredible woman. She'd be cool to have on your show. I'm she's, nice she's really um, smart and she runs that studio. And, and uh, it was just great. It was, it was really magical. It was, very, that's the word that I would use is magical. I love that. Yeah. And um, and so then you, you mentioned George Shapiro. Yeah. So you did another project with George. Yeah. Uh, De Bronx. De Bronx, yeah. Which I am from, De Bronx. Yeah, so it's perfect. <laughs> and George was actually on the show, on Game Changers with us, right when he was putting it all together uh -huh. last winter. And uh, we were talking as two Bronxers. So what was it like being in, in the Bronx, in De Bronx with George? It was great because, you know, he loves that town, you know, that city. And, and did he take you for pizza? Um, yeah, we, we did, we all went, you know, and we, 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 spent, the, we spent a day in, in the city, in Manhattan, yeah. recording. And, and then the next day we were, in, we were in the Bronx. Making noise. We were in the Bronx filming the opening segment, it's like a big musical segment for this movie called The Bronx USA. I can't wait to which see it. Which it's just, uh, was released on HBO, so it's out there now, it just came out. And wow. it's on the Oscar shortlist for the song. That um, Charlie Fox and, and Paul Williams wrote that I worked can you, on. Can you do a little bit? Uh, no, no, that's like a full big, that's okay. like, that's a huge band. I would love to, but um, no. Paul Williams, Paul Williams? Paul, Paul Williams wrote the lyrics. Char Paul Williams was here in this living room he was? singing <laughs> a Rainbow Connection. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you kidding me or that what? Paul and, and Rainy Days and Mondays, and he told us the story that he wrote it for his mother. Yeah. I, I love Paul Williams. Yeah, me too. Oh my God. Me too. All right, so Paul Williams and wrote and, it. And with Charlie Fox. Okay. And Charles Fox, who's like written. So many hits. Okay, I have a problem with Charlie Fox though. Why? Well, because of the Lori Lieberman "Killing Me Softly" thing. It's like this whole big controversy okay. because Lori wrote the poem that inspired right. the song, right. but she didn't get credit for a million years and is just recently being acknowledged for it. Lori, I love you. That makes and sense. And so Charlie's son wrote me when I had Lori on, and right. I said when she was at Women Who Write, and I said Lori wrote the music that's the lyrics that inspired. Him. He said, "No, my father wrote the," mm -hmm. and so I have a little thing. But I don't know the backstory because I never heard it. Um, I mean, oh, I, the story. No, I know You've the song. You've heard the song. Of course. The Roberta <laughs> Flack version the first time. Um, so I don't know it, so I can't weigh in on that, no. but, I, but I get it. Yeah, um, I, but my experience with, with Charlie is he's uh, incredibly he's talented and, and he's and a lovely guy. Mm -hmm. That's been yeah. my experience. It's wonderful. Um, so, and it was a thrill to work with those guys too. And Charlie played piano. And, and we're, we did, um, we went to New York. Mm -hmm. I put a New York band together. And uh, who was in your New York, I used to be a music promoter in New York. Who was in your New York band? Uh, we had uh, Terry Silverlight on drums. Um, Will Lee played bass. Oh. Um, I love you, Will. Yeah, we, it was, there's too many names to mention. Okay. It was like, it was a lot of people. Um, 
I, I will actually put those, I, I'll Facebook up as well with the okay, list good. of everybody. Okay, fabulous. I can do that tomorrow. And you know, so I didn't know it was already on HBO. I'm it just so got, excited. It just got released and I just found out that the song is on the Oscar shortlist. I love so, that. So, and it's a, it's a What's great the song, song called? It's called The Bronx. The Bronx? Yeah. The movie is called The Bronx. Oh, USA. is it really? Yes. Oh, okay. The song is called The Bronx. Okay. Yeah. It, it was like, it was just really fun to be in, on the streets of the Bronx, you know, with people that grew up there and just watching their love of, of that city. Okay, so talking about growing up there, where did you grow up, Terry? Miami. With, born and raised so in Miami. interesting. But my dad was born and grew up in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. and my And so I have kind of, you know, some New York roots. And yeah. all Jews end up in Miami, yeah. so that's just kind of what happens. Kind of. They went to, to thaw out, you know, and, and then stay. You know, and was your mom from? My mom was from Mount Clemens, Michigan, a small town. Jews in Michigan? Yeah. Oh, my Orthodox. God. Yeah, her, 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 oh. her, my dad, like, was Reformed. You right. Know, um, and, but my mom's grandfather was a, I think he was um, a cantor. My father was a cantor. Really? Yeah, I think wow. so. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, I'd have to go like revisit I'm our trying to remember history. what the name, there's a Jewish deli in Michigan that I went to. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I can't remember the name. It's not, I'm Blangers is here. Anyway, mm -hmm. there's, there, it, there are wax. Jews. What? Lid wax or something? Not, that's yeah. not the one I went okay. to. There's a famous one my daughter uh, was going to audition, audition for you, Michigan. Okay. So there's yeah. one there. Yeah. I think there was like a deli in the family like, you know, years, <laughs> many, many years ago. So, but anyway, so I was born in Miami and grew up there. And so what was that, what, so the music, were you the influenced mu by Latin music? Yes, I, I, was, I was influenced in more ways than I knew mm -hmm. by um, all kinds of music because Criteria Recording Studios was down there, so like Fleetwood Mac, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, there was that whole scene going on down there. You know, it people was going recording on in Florida? In, totally. Who knew in, this? In Miami. Like I did not know um, this. Eric Clapton would come there to record. Wow. And it's because Miami was beautiful. There was water. The Bee Gees lived there. They moved to Miami. So that all that staying alive Saturday Night Fever stuff was recorded in Miami. You're kidding. So I, I got to like kind of be a fly on the wall for some sessions. I knew a few people and, and you know, I just wow. begged if I could just keep my mouth shut and watch it. When anything. the Bee Gees were in there? Uh, I went to a couple Bee Gees sessions when overdubs were going on, not when they were singing. But when they were adding key keyboard parts and things like that, just to to watch, and then like I'd walk in, and then like Fleetwood Mac would be in the other room recording. Oh my god! So, so it kind of, that really influenced me because I wanted to be a studio musician. Okay, so let's talk about how that started. Yeah. So you're a little kid. What's the first thing you want to be? Um, probably a I, I think a fireman or a garbage man. Okay. Yeah. The, you know, to, could you be able to ride on the back of the truck? <laughs> I just get or drive the back of the truck. I, I absolutely yeah, love it. Those okay. are probably the you, you just things. got some love when you, <laughs> when you said garbage man. It's like all of a sudden you got love. I'm you know something my dad had told me uh, when I was younger and when he was alive and, and he he said whatever you do in life just be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. He said if you want to be a garbage man be the best garbage man that you can be if you want to be a musician. You know, just really give it all. Okay, so how all. did music come into your life? Um, it kind of was there. We were forced. My brother. Was your father a musician? No, I'm like, no. My dad was a phys ed teacher. Okay. So I grew up exercising. That's why, like I said, I'm not used to getting sick. I'm, right. And exercise and eat healthy and all that stuff. And, and, but, so my dad was a phys ed teacher. And your mom? My mom was a school teacher too, an elementary school okay. teacher. So I come from a family of educators. And was she musical? No. But they, but you know what it was? They just like gave us obligatory music lessons. Like, so we, my older brother yeah. and I, they started us on guitar. That's oh, no, 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 no. Did they? No, I think they started us on piano. They yeah. bought a piano. That was the very Jewish Right, thing right. So, the, and that's why they did it. So, <laughs> it, and, and they believed in education, mm -hmm. of course. So, yes. so I took piano lessons for a year and then, and loved the piano. Mm -hmm. And I still play, but I, but I, I love it. We've but, got one right over there, uh, Terry. We could maybe turn it on. No, we'll, we'll leave you on your instrument. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> my primary instrument. But but I really I started like I remember hearing "Let It Be" on the on the radio, so I figured it out on the piano. I like and and I, the teacher goes, "No, don't do that." Which so I was discouraged from being creative. I, they said that's wow. not what we're supposed to be doing. You need to learn the vocal boat man and you know like you know the the little basic you know kids tunes and all that and so 
I gave up the piano. I kept playing on my own, but then we switched to guitar. Mm -hmm. My older brother and I took lessons on that, and I had like a, a musical knack. Yeah. You know, like a you know, like a gift. A, I guess, yeah. I didn't view it as that, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not a, like a savant. Like, Do you I, like the perfect pitch? Yeah. No? I have okay. really great relative pitch, but okay. I don't have perfect pitch. Okay. Um, but I, I definitely just, I always loved music. I was always like, I was drawn to it like a zombie. I would hear, like... So what, what, <laughs> what what's your recollection of like the first music that like just blew your mind out? Like, because we're the yeah. same age, so the yeah. Beatles on its own had to have impact. Beatles, obviously. absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, the obvious, mm -hmm. the Beatles, I, I just thought it was amazing. I, I just, it was so exciting. I wanted to crawl inside the TV too and just be in it. Um, I, but the first, you know, some of my early recollections were like my first album that I had was The Monkees. Yeah. You know, and what? Play Along with Adventures. Okay, so Mickey was in the living room. He Nesmith was? Oh, produced man. my show up oh, north. The Monkees, of course. They were great. And their songs yeah. were great. So yes. I I you know I feel like The Ventures, oh my the god. The Ventures. Yes. Did you learn Walk Don't Run? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not very well. I was a little kid, but <laughs> yes. Uh, and I learned how to tune the guitar because the very first song, track one, was called Tune It. <laughs> and it would be, you would hear it like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was track one. That's so you tune to the record. Um, that's where I learned to tune the guitar. But one of the things that really made me realize that I'm just like, I have this, this hunger for music was Otis Redding sitting on the dock of the bed. And I was in junior high school mm -hmm. and I was out, I used to run. The track was my thing, and so I was running, and there was a, a limo driver who had parked in the shade, like, you know, outside of the school on mm -hmm. the street, and was waxing the car or something, and had the radio on with the windows open, and that's what was drifting through the air, and I literally, like, just walked across the field towards the sound of, of that soul R&B, mm -hmm. that, that's what really got me at a young age, like, R&B soul music, um, and pop music, and then later on learn jazz. And okay, so what? Uh, how did you? Because uh, jazz is very tricky for me. Yeah. Um, especially really out there eclectic yeah. jazz. Yeah, absolutely. It's way too sophisticated for me. I yeah. can't. But uh, every musician I know mm -hmm. is in is in love and in awe with the jazz. So, so what is it that pulled you there? Because I, I don't really understand it. The improvisational aspect. Okay. That's what drew me in the 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 idea that you just mm -hmm. show up and have the the vocabulary and the tools to just mm -hmm. jump in and and create and play and and that carries over into rock and pop. I mean, when when you're in a garage band and you play with people and you jam, that's what you're doing. You're mm -hmm. responding. It's mm -hmm. um you know, and you're listening. It's the same skill set. I think maybe there that you know, there's more maybe rules or, or scales and things mm -hmm. like that in jazz, but I, I became like a sort of an accidental jazz musician. I, you know, because I didn't really grow up on it as much. There wasn't that, um, like the, the records that we had in our house mm -hmm. were the, the, those two that I had, The Monkees and the Play Along Adventures. Mm -hmm. And then we had that comedy album uh, with the Kennedys. Oh Remember my that? God. Yeah. So the, like there wasn't really a lot of music. We would and and the stripper. David I don't know Rose. why. Da, 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 ba, da, ba, 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 which was kind of jazz tune. Also, and I don't know why we had that. You know, those were like the two records that were in the house. And but then there were a couple of uh, older teenage girls that lived next door, and I'd go over there, and then they would they would have Led Zeppelin, The Doors. Mm -hmm. um, the Stones. Yeah, definitely the Stones. I mean, of, and I was hearing the Stones and, and the Beatles, of course, everywhere. Right. You know, I certainly was that influence. But even like Cream, like Israeli gear. Oh, yeah. You know, all that yeah. stuff. Spirit, mm -hmm. in a uh, Los Angeles-based band. Oh, I knew yeah. about them in Miami. Hendrix? Well, of course, Jimi Hendrix and then Stevie Ray Vaughan and, mm -hmm. and on and on as I get older. But absolutely. But that the psychedelic rock stuff, mm -hmm. that really spoke to me because in Miami... It's really bright outside. The sun mm -hmm. shines a lot, and you grow up. You're on your bicycle a lot, and you're out. out you know, go out and play. We don't want to see you till it's five o'clock. Mm -hmm. No cell phones. No pay. You know, not just right. you know, be home for dinner. But get out of the house. It's Saturday. Mm -hmm. You turn off the TV mm -hmm. and don't come back till five. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of beautiful that you could do that. That it was, right. even though there were 
perverts and things like that. You still have to be careful, but it was the same it time. Was, it, yeah, it was different times. It was a more yeah. innocent time. Mm-hmm. You still have to be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think like the pervert thing, until eating Pat's mm-hmm. got... Yeah. And was on the first milk carton. Yes. That's like when the whole craziness right. that I became aware of. But before that, we used to go play outside. Yeah. That's what we, we did. did. We yeah. did. But we would go to our friends' houses, and then you'd go into one of their bedrooms with the, we'd have a really cool stereo and and like you know Zeppelin one and two, mm-hmm. and you would just like have a black light on. I I wasn't even like taking drugs. I was. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it, most everybody was. My my parents were strict, you know, so right. I was afraid. I was just afraid. Mm-hmm. So I missed out on a lot of that That's when I was good. younger, which That's is, good. it was good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I smoked pot. I tried it when I was 14 or something or 13 and and nothing really happened because it was... Almost that only would have been my story. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah, it was, a, but I had a lot of friends who, um, I mean, I had a friend who, you know, walked off a ledge tripping on LSD and died, you know, oh, like, no. I mean, we and kids who were pills and all kinds of stuff. So I was not naive to it. I was just scared to, to do it. However, I still was around, like even my friends, like I'd go pick psilocybin mushrooms with my friends, you know, in the cow fields. And, and then, not do that. No, then they would all cook them up or make milkshakes with mushrooms and I would hang with them. So I kind of had the, 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 the Sort of experience. You were like drug adjacent. Yeah, I was contact drug. Yeah, I, yeah you know, drug adjacent. I, I yeah. just have to quickly, uh, last night I went to a screening of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh-huh. and, and seen Leo and Brad were there. Yeah. There's just one scene where um, where Brad Pitt smokes a cigarette that was dipped in acid. Mm. And so at one point, I, I'm in, a, in, a, in an audience of actors. Right. And at one point he, he goes like this. And then... <laughs> It got the biggest laugh in the whole movie because, right, he's seeing the ash. Right. Right. Like right. Everybody who's ever sure. been there sure. is like, whoa. Yeah, Absolutely. I know. It was just terrible. Anyway. So, so um, but I, w- I was around it, but but also, so I, for me, I think my altered state experiences mm-hmm. were being around my friends that were high, mm-hmm. but generally listening to music with or without them taking anything. Still, you, you know, you look at a lava light, you know, pull the shades, and you listen okay, to Okay, so you're listening. Music. Are you playing along with? Are you going home and playing? I started doing? doing that, too. Okay. Yes, mm-hmm. um, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, remember, we only had four albums in our house. <laughs> so you couldn't learn. No, I would. So I would, because my parents were not musical, so they didn't like go. Oh, we're gonna get you a little forty-five record player. Okay. I kind of didn't get to do that, but I listened to the radio constantly, mm-hmm. and anytime like you know, like empty pages by Traffic came on, it's like I stopped what I was doing. To, I pictured the whole piano solo. But you can't, you can't stop the radio. To, no. Let me go back and learn no. that. So I guess maybe that's part of the reason I ended up becoming a producer and arranger as well as a player because I was diving in. Mm. I was like just trying to hear everything, as as opposed to you know spending hours. I spent hours and hours playing, mm-hmm. but when I was a kid, kid, I wasn't like you know picking up the needle and trying to list to learn every Hendrix back. Right. I'm sorry I didn't get to do that. Mm-hmm. I do it now. I still do it. I love it. <laughs> you know, and now you can stop. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I, it, my musical upbringing was sort of kind of a broad stroke, mm-hmm. you know, and then, so I still play piano on my own. I was taking guitar for a couple of years. Uh, the, once again, got a teacher. I think some of it growing up on a um, teacher's salary mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of money mm-hmm. you know we were taking milk bottles back you know on the right. way to the grocery store and stuff like that and um so so the thing is um uh, we we the teacher that we had was kind of like he looked like mel bay you know the guy like on the <laughs> anybody like yeah, you, know, sure. you know the guy in the cover of all the the uh music books that we learned out of mm-hmm. and he just was like just sort of you know just passing through he, he wasn't really passionate Mm-hmm. about what he did so I didn't really wasn't encouraged again to be creative mm-hmm. I was learning to read music and all that stuff and learning where the notes were all good things but mm-hmm. but I didn't really have the right teachers until I get older the ones who go you know something mm-hmm. dive off a cliff with that you know go listen and if you're curious go figure it out and then bring it back to so the- how at what stage of your life did that start to happen did that passion come um really high school okay you know when I had are you in bands yeah, I was playing. Yeah, I started playing in band. I played clarinet in junior high school. So did I. You did? So, so Spider Bites. Except 
I could I cheated. I used to put my hair because I couldn't. I because I, I, I was looking. Yeah. It was not my uh, finest hour. I, you know, I, it was I not wanted, mine either. I actually wanted. I didn't want to play clarinet. I actually wanted to play um, trumpet. I or, wanted to play flute. You were saxophone. There were too many flutes. Yeah. Flutes. So they needed clarinet players, and, and they didn't need guitar. You know, it was band. Right, it was right. you know, it was orchestral. Oh, so right. I did that for a year. Mm -hmm. um, it was cool to learn how to play an ensemble, but I always wanted to. Be, I wanted to be a sax player, or a trumpet player, and do the choreography yeah, and like you sure. know all that stuff and play in a section. Uh, which is what you do as a rhythm section player, as a guitar player. You right. play in a section. You find your your place in the machinery, in the groove of it, um, which I, I really love. So I did that. And then, you know, my dad had basically, it was around, when I was 15, we moved to Mexico City with my That's dad. That's exotic. Not my mom. My parents had already split up. Okay. So my older brother, I have two brothers, and my older brother and I, my younger brother lived with my mom because mm -hmm. he was too young. Older brother and I ended up living with my dad, long story. Um, but we went to Mexico with him for six months and lived there and went oh. to school there. And that's when I got serious about the guitar. I you must be speaking some good Spanish there. And then I became fluent. Uh, of course you did. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they didn't teach in English, I assume. No, everything was in Spanish. And, oh, yeah. and we studied. That had to be challenging when you got there. Extremely. Whoa. We just got thrown into the deep end of the pool. Ooh. And we were going to go to a, a regular high school mm -hmm. at that point. And the high schools, the good ones, well, the, the regular high schools, which is where we really wanted to go, my dad wanted us to just experience the culture. Yeah. If you're in whatever grade we were in at 15 years old, is that ninth grade? I guess, 10th? Yeah, 10th. No, 10th tenth. Tenth grade. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in 10th grade, then you take 10th grade level math, whatever. You're, so regardless of whether you are, have excelled, mm -hmm. you know, you're in the same class. So it wasn't going to be the good education we needed. Right. We looked at private schools and they, the private schools were all like Americanized mm. and they were all wanted to speak English. So mm. we weren't going to be exposed. My dad was on a sabbatical, which they used to have back then. So we, he was at the University of Mexico. Mm -hmm. We ended up studying at the University of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I was 15 years old in college for six months mm -hmm. around a bunch of adults. And we were taking three Spanish classes a day and, mm -hmm. and they didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. The very first day, you know, you know, hola, que pasa, como se llama? You know, you know. And What's your name? Yeah, How's it going? Yeah. I got it. And the thing is, so, like, I didn't understand any of it. So you just really had to just start, you know, this, my dog's name is, right. you know, how do you say, what, you know. So did you, did yeah. you lose education mm. by having to spend so much time with the language? No, uh, because... Uh -huh. I mean, the thing is, because my dad was an educator, mm -hmm. and we, there, there was some negotiating going on with the school principal back home, but my dad, I think, had to make a very expensive, long-distance, international <laughs> phone call and just get permission to just say, I'm going to put them in college. We'll make up the classes. or wow. they'll, they'll, They transferred college credits, you know, wow. for high school credits. And, then, mm -hmm. and we took history, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mexican history. We took art. Nice. Um, which was great. I ran track. And, and you play music? Yes. And then I bought a nylon string guitar okay. in Mexico. Flamenco. Yeah, I started and then found people and they started teaching me Spanish songs. Wow. I, I even learned some this is a um, Spanish guy, but he taught me the Beatles song yesterday. <laughs> Kind of a Spanish -y classical Beautiful. feel, the way I learned it. But I learned that when I was fifteen, and mm -hmm. it was like incredibly hard and complicated. And then when I came back, you know, my dad, my dad was a big influence on me, mm -hmm. and and he basically said, "Look, you know, you, you should pick something, mm -hmm. like you know, get good at something." He goes, and he basically said, and I might have told you this like off the air at some time when we've just chatted, but he said, "Shit or get off the pot." Mm -hmm. He said. Pick some, pick an instrument, you know. Like if you want to. Oh, you hadn't you had Well, I, there was heard. guitar and piano. I okay. still play piano. And he okay. said, he goes, you can do more than one thing, but you seem to love music, uh -huh. and you have you have a knack for it and a mm -hmm. drive for it, and you love track, and you know you're running and you're mm -hmm. you're being serious about that and focus. So focus on this. Like just go. You know, I'm not saying do that for a living. Uh -huh. I'm just saying shit or get off the pot. Okay. So I got serious about guitar and I went, I love this, I want to learn how to do it. And and then I found people when I came back. 
I had friends who were great musicians, so, and they were taking lessons, and they would come and teach me what their teacher taught them. Nice. Yeah. And you weren't taking lessons. I, we didn't have the money. Yeah. Okay. So no. So. And we take. I took lessons from people from my peers. Uh huh. And so how how did how did that translate to an occupation? At what point did did you start playing for money? Um. Well, actually, I had a gig when I our first gig was when I was probably like ten years old or something. <laughs> with like myself and another friend who played electric guitar and a drummer and we went down to the Castaways Hotel or something in Miami Beach and asked if we could audition and then we played the three songs we knew and then they said all right you're hired you can play this afternoon I think they whatever they paid us I don't know $25 that, that for the whole thing. That was enterprising. It was. And My money mentor, Anson Williams, would be so impressed with this story because he started making money when he was a yeah. and also. So it was really cool. <laughs> uh, but we, you know, we had to keep playing the same three songs over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it was, it was so, so... Do you remember what three songs no, those were? They were three Beatles songs. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. The, but when did it turn into like, okay, this is... When, I, I would say high school. Okay. Then I started like... Um, Late, I started playing like in coffee houses, mm -hmm. some restaurants with some friends. Mm -hmm. We would, it was more like Joni Mitchell songs, <gasps> Cat Stevens, mm -hmm. you know, like the folk rock stuff. Sure. Where, uh, you know, we would all sing and, mm -hmm. and it, and that was really, I think where I started, well, not I think, that's where I started getting my performance experience, but I was in drama mm -hmm. too. Like, so I was, you know taking acting classes and creative writing classes and you were on stage i was on stage not as much playing guitar more right. like learning lines or right. or improv and things like that mm -hmm. but but yes yeah, so i that's where i started i my earlier experiences were more like in, in being in plays and things like that and then playing coffee house in school mm -hmm. and then playing like we played at a health food restaurant called the garden restaurant mm -hmm. and i did my first voiceover for the garden restaurant, like I, for a radio commercial, somebody just said, oh, you have a nice speaking voice, you you should do this. I ended up on, the first time I heard myself on the radio was talking about the garden restaurant. And, nice. and Casey, um, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Casey lived in Miami, so he used to come into the restaurant. So it was sort of my first brush with celebrity, you know, it's just <laughs> like, you know, and then getting to go to his house and, you know. Okay, so, so, let, so speaking of that, yeah. so you, you musical directed and played with a lot of... Yes. Incredible people. Mm -hmm. Was Billy Preston the first? Who was the first person? Billy Preston, yeah, good mm -hmm. call. Billy Preston was my first celebrity. Okay. Uh, like my first rock star that I what, played with. What time in his career was that? 1981. So it was, he was hot. Very, very. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, he and Sarita Wright had Born Again, their mm -hmm. duet. So um, I was parking cars at the Playboy Mansion, <laughs> making money like we do. You know, oh, everybody has like yeah, the a, day job. a story. Yeah, yeah. You know, when they come out. Uh, what so, a day job. Yeah, it was. So that was an eye opener. And then I park. I, and one of the people that I parked cars with and literally played in a garage band with, we would get together and just jam and play. Um, he was Billy Strong, and he had a lot of the people that were parking cars at the mansion were like actors and musicians, and somebody would disappear for three months and then they'd come back and where you been? Oh, I was. I did this tour with so and so, or I was in this movie and. Then they're backing up parking cars. And uh -huh. so, but anyway, I said to my friend, I saw him go, come and go probably two international tours and come back. And I finally said, okay, I can't, t I can't not say this to you. You're my friend. I didn't move here to park cars. <laughs> you know, I moved here to play music. And I had already gone to music school at Berkeley and gotten a degree in arranging. And, mm -hmm. and, and I had already, you know something? I take was, that, was that your passion? Is arranging? It's like, all my passion. Yeah. I, I love playing and I love producing and yes, I do love arranging. Uh, Jeremy Stevens, who's uh, my life coach he, and a friend, he, he said mm -hmm. that, uh, I said, he said, pick one horse. I said, I can't pick one yeah. horse. You know, I, I do this, this. He said, well, when you ride that one horse, mm -hmm. ride it like it's the only horse you're ever going to ride. Yeah. So when you produce, you just produce. When you, yeah. yeah and, and so if you have, pour that passion to the thing you're doing at the time, you can do Absolutely. many less. And, yeah. You know, and... And I stay in my lane. If I'm asked to do something, I don't go, oh, can I play guitar for you? Right. Um, you know, when, when that works out that way, I love it. It makes me okay, really so happy. Okay, so what happened with Billy Preston? Well, Billy Preston, so I, I told my friend, mm -hmm. Jerry, I said, if there's ever an opportunity, if 
to audition for Billy, I would just be so grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to say this one time. I'm not going to ask you again. And it, as long as it doesn't compromise your relationship with Billy. Right. And, and he goes, okay. And a couple months later, I get a call. What are you doing tomorrow morning? You know, and I said, nothing, practicing, you know, and he, he said, well, there's an audition at Billy's house, you know, and so I went to Motown on wow. Sunset Boulevard. They gave me like 20 Billy Preston LPs and said, learn these 50 songs. Wow. <laughs> no, you know, just learn, you know, they no charts, no anything. And, and so I had a day, you wow. know, and I just like, just did the best I could and then went there auditioned for Billy and got the tour and we went to we went to Europe we went to Germany for a month and then how we many songs did they make you play at your audition of those 50 songs we don't I don't even think we played any of them at the audition oh. they like started playing other stuff so wow. it was like and it's like what do you do you well you just yeah. play yeah yeah so um but I it and there was another guitar player that Billy already knew he was a British guitar player mm -hmm. don't remember his name um but he was there auditioning simultaneously they put us in the room together which was the weirdest <laughs> dumbest thing and really disrespectful to both of us yeah and you know I'm like what I'm early 20s I don't know anything and he's a rocker you know and he's like re really loud and you know British rock guy great player and I'm thinking this I see the ship sailing away <laughs> without me and, and it was really loud mm -hmm. you know Billy's playing his B3 and everybody's like throwing down we're dripping wet and I thought, I need to do whatever it takes to make myself hurt, literally. Mm -hmm. I turned around to my amp and turned it to 10. <laughs> and just like got up and right in Billy's face and just started, you know, funking out. And I got hired. Wow. Yeah. And, and went. And, but the thing is, I, I want to take it back. The first celebrity that I actually worked with mm -hmm. was uh, Joe Sample and the Crusaders. Um, but, well, that wow. time... It would all kind of happen around the same time. Uh -huh. um, but I was doing some, like I was assisting Joe. Like mm -hmm. not, I ended up playing on one of their records, which was incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I basically was Joe's, Joe's an arranger and was an arranger, amazing. And deep influence on me. One of my you know, most important music mentors mm -hmm. in, in my life. And basically, you know, was around like helping get charts ready and driving them to the copyists, you know, pre fax machines and messengers and all that stuff. And, and then, you know, making, picking the charts up at seven in the morning and getting to the studio and sitting with Joe next to him at the piano bench, writing things out with him. And cool. so I was doing that. And then I got the Billy Preston tour, like almost, I had been here almost a year okay. and then got that. But that was like my tour. Like, it's like, this is it. This is what I well. dreamt of. It was unbelievable. Like I remember that feeling like it didn't feel like 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 it was real until we got on the plane. We're leaving at night. We're taking off. Wheels up. I look down. I see all these twinkling lights, and I go, "I got it. I got it." That's so great. Yeah. And then so what? Uh, so you played with a lot of. Yeah. Were you able to just parlay that into the next, into the next, no. into the next, or did you have to? I had to you, just start over again. Okay. So I, are, you, are you parking cars again? Uh, I came back and I had to park cars and it broke my heart. Yeah. Uh, I was still working with the Crusaders and doing more things with them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is so weird because like, you know, like I did a great job and like I had a lot to learn. I was, when they say green, you're green. You don't right. know anything. Right. You don't, I didn't know to bring a, a towel and a clean shirt to change into after the show, the first show, because I didn't know that I was going to be completely soaking wet <laughs> in sweat. You know, I didn't know. I mean, I knew I'd get sweaty. I didn't know what it was like to play concert level. Right. And nobody told me. They, nobody watches out for you. They just let you, like, you know, crash and burn on your own. And then you learn your lesson. Right. I, you know, I don't mind sharing lessons with people along the way. But that that's what it was like then. Um, but I came back and it's like, I thought I was going to get another tour and another tour. And then I start to do more record dates because mm -hmm. I wanted to make records. You wanted to be a session player too. I wanted, I wanted to be the guy on the back of the record, not the front. Why is that? I just, cause I grew up reading album credits mm -hmm. and, and I think also because I didn't, I wasn't really a singer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I instrumental, just, it was much harder to be front yeah, and there wasn't really, instrumentalist. Yeah. There wasn't, nobody was really. I mean, straight ahead jazz, yes. Right. But that didn't really hold my interest back then. Right. So pop, rock, music. 
Yeah, it wasn't instrumental. Yeah, it was all vocal, yeah. and I thought, well, I'm never, I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my gift. I mean, I'm singing more now mm -hmm. and loving it. I'm mm -hmm. actually even studying voice now, and I'm Fabulous. having a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, yeah, it's fantastic. And but the thing is, I so I thought, but I want to write songs. I want to be the guy playing guitar. I want to be the guy that like wrote the string arrangement and conducted. Mm -hmm. You know, I was enamored by credits. Okay, so yeah. let's let's just uh, so because yeah. we we're gonna we yeah. have special guests we're gonna bring out. So let's <laughs> let's uh, go through like so Al Jarreau, mm -hmm. so um, Melissa Manchester. Let's just a, a, a few highlights. Al Jarreau, yeah. um, who was um, one of the thrills and joys of my life to to get to know Al and to work with him. Um, I worked with him for the very first time when I was music directing the Byron Allen show. Okay. Because I've music directed and played guitar for two late night talk shows, the the late show on Fox after Joan Rivers did it. First, uh, no, it was Jack Beck and the Heart Attack was the house band. Wow. Yeah, and okay. so and then I got hired to be the music director mm -hmm. for them and for the show. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then that did that for a year, and that parlayed into my first album came out that year. Uh, 1988, it was mm -hmm. Bimini, and then Byron Allen had heard it, he was looking for a music director, somebody from that show, like when you say yes to things, and you go in, and you're of service, and you just give it 100%, and do that and more, mm -hmm. people pay attention. That goes back to what your father said, whatever you're going to do, be your best. Right. Always be your best. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is the secret to everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was great advice, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful for it. So I, I went in, and did that, and then Byron... I was recommended by one of the producers from the Late Show to Byron, who was an executive producer for the pilot. Mm -hmm. And Byron happened to have happened to have my first album. He didn't know that ITV experience. Wow! That led to three years of doing that, um, writing all the music for the show, leading the band, and working with incredible artists, including Al Jarreau. That was the first time ah. I had met Al. So, mm -hmm. and I had done so, and I would get to know them more intimately because I was doing the arrangements for the right. show as well, mm -hmm. and then playing guitar and leading the band and interacting mm -hmm. with the artists mm -hmm. and the labels and everything too, mm -hmm. managers. So um, I kind of, it was a big learning curve for me mm -hmm. to learn how to deal with every aspect of that. But it was kind of the dream job for me because it does require you to be an arranger, a producer, a great player, a, you know, and then be on camera, how to figure out how to do that. Um, it was using all your skills. It was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learning some new ones to, mm -hmm. to augment that or, or sharpen them up. But so I worked it out. It was like, I, I literally went home that night and I, it was like I had accomplished my goal. That was wow. like, that was, I mean, Billy Preston was incredible, you know, but like, I kind of felt like, wow, this is what I, this is what I dreamt of, mm -hmm. these kind of things. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly inspiring. Years mm -hmm. later, just a few years back, I produced, co-produced Melissa Manchester's 20th album. You How know did about. that happen? Um, I knew Melissa. I, I met her on the Byron Allen show, too. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really ever get to know each other that well, but we did a song together. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, years later, um, she was working with my friend Kevin Mo. Mm -hmm. and, and Kevin said, uh, hey, this old for this friend, old friend of yours is here, you should come by and say hi, and he wanted me to help him write out an arrangement or something. I went over and he reintroduced me, and then I said, we've met, and my, my friend Peter Hume was her music director, I go to college with him, so, and so we reconnected, and we just became friends. Mm -hmm. And we developed a friendship, and then it led to us recording together. Uh, she became an independent artist for the first time, so she was asking me mm -hmm. if she could pick my brain about how do you end up on the radio and wow. as an independent artist, because uh -huh. she had been signed since she was young right. to Arista, and mm -hmm. you know, it was all handled. Mm -hmm. So I t told her what I knew and, and encouraged her, and then she came back and said, would you produce this record with me? And I said, I'd be thrilled. So I did that, and we got Al to come and sing a duet with her, so Sweet. I got to, Full circle, wow. work with Alwyn again towards the end of his life, and it was really just an incredibly beautiful experience. I just want to um, something piggyback on something you yeah. just said. My mentor Anson Williams told me that to make a list of everybody that I know, and somewhere on that list is somebody that can help. Yeah. And every time I have said that out loud, somebody stood up and said, "I want to help." As a matter of fact, Ron, 
I said it. At, I said it at yeah. a Women Who Ride. I said, "Oh, Pete's going to be going out of town. I'm going to need somebody to work the camera." And Ron mm-hmm. reached out and he said, "Thank you." I, you know, <laughs> I, um, I want to help if I can help, and that's how I got Pete because I said, you right. know, I, Anson told me to make a list of everybody I know, and somebody's going to help, and Pete said, let me take you out to coffee because mm-hmm. I want to be one of those people. And it's, great. it's like we don't think, I don't, I didn't think to do that until I was kind of prodded to do it. Yeah. But it's like every time I've ever said it out loud, mm-hmm. people want to help. People want to be of service. Yeah. Um, and it's also about being able to ask for help. Right. And that's kind of a tricky thing to, it is. It to, is. to, to be able to yeah. do. So that's really great. Okay, so Melissa, who else, I'm trying to think of who else on your on your list that um, I should pick. So what, what, give us a highlight, um, like one of the greatest creative, artistic, thrilling showbiz moments of your life. Stevie Wonder. Oh <laughs> God. All right, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Tell no, us about that. It was also on Melissa's record. Mm-hmm. Um, Stevie, um, we got him, we asked him. And same thing, you just asked. And uh, she knew him, I had, uh, Good friend who was friends and grew up with him, mm-hmm. and uh, but I didn't really know him. I think I met him, you know, backstage one time or something. But but we we reached out to him. He said he was interested, and then we never heard back. And then I asked my friend. We we're getting towards the end of the record, mm-hmm. and we were starting to mix. Mm-hmm. And then so my friend reached out, and Stevie called Melissa later that day, and we were recording with him within a couple of days. And he came and he played harmonica, and we were knee to knee, talking, laughing, you know. And and I've heard he's very easy. He's incredibly easy. Mm-hmm. He's very funny. He's That's a jokester. Great. He's so gifted, mm-hmm. and 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 his heart is big. His generosity mm-hmm. is just so um, there. You know, it's just large. You know, and it expanded me. It did not my head. It mm-hmm. expanded. Melissa, the, both of us, Melissa oh. too, and Melissa's a superstar. Mm-hmm. It we we felt like energetically expanded from the experience, and to sit next to him, you know, for for him, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's really funny. But um, he he basically, you know, when he said, "All right, so Terry, I know that you must have some idea of what you want me to do." So I want to make, and he brought like a, you know, um, a briefcase full of harmonicas, you know, wow. trying different things. He said. Uh-huh. He goes, so I just want you to know that, uh, tell me what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, please let me know so that I can do it. And I said, thank you. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. That's what I was planning on doing. But thanks for offering that. He goes, that's some motherfucking bullshit. (laughs) And he hits me. (laughs) (laughs) It was just, and then we just, and he burst out laughing and we all started laughing. You know, and then we recorded and it was just great. I, mean, I love said. that so much. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do some shout outs to people out here. We're going to see if yeah. that, does anybody have any questions, Ron? I, I haven't really been uh, looking here too much, but hi, Deborah. Hi, Jolene. Um, uh, uh, Jolene saying, Terry, um, love to you and your beautiful bride. And we're going to get to that. Thank in you. A look minute. at this. Uh, this is yeah. my biggest accomplishment. Okay, so when did you guys get married? <laughs> in August. In August. Yeah. And we're going to talk about your, your beautiful bride in a moment. Not Thank only you, are we going to talk about her, but we're going to hear some music. Yeah. Trish says, beautiful music. Andrew, Peg, Armand, Darren. Um, hi, Melanie. Says, fabulous. Hi, Michael. <laughs> hi, Ma- hey, Michael. Roy Schwartz, who I made the soup with, kind of. Uh, in, uh, Jim Taylor. Um, okay, Rob says, hey, Vicki and Terry, I'm really enjoying the stories and finding out about Terry's music. Okay, your adventures. Hey, Jack. Hey, Janet. Hey, da- hey David Lucky. He's a great singer-songwriter. Mm-hmm. Do you know David? No, I don't. Great singer-songwriter. Very, very it. funny. Hi, Penny. I miss you. DJ, hi, Mary. Hi, Ro- oh, Rose. Sweet Rose. So, okay. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yes. We don't take it for granted. I know. So, uh, a couple things I want to talk about quickly. Yeah. So, my publisher uh, yeah. is your uh, film cohort, Carl Reiner. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we have that in common. I also wanted to talk uh, for a second because I can't do this without help. Yeah. Like Ron's sitting behind the camera. Oh, it takes so, a there's, yeah. it takes a village. It yeah. takes. With me, it really it, it takes a city because I, you know, the therapist, the life coach, the you know, it's like the the twelve, the sponsor. It's like on and on and on and on. But also, there's the person, this guy, Rick Smolke of Quick Impressions of Chicago. Uh-huh. Seriously, since I started Women Who Ride eleven years ago, he said, "I want to help." I've heard you mention him. He said, yeah. "I want to help. Yeah. What can I do?" And he started making me swag. I gave out swag 
every single month that women write to all the women. Yeah. Calendars, yeah. teammate tissue boxes. Wow. When we cried for Mackenzie Phillips. I could have used um, that last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, you poor thing. Yeah. He, he makes my bookmarks, my yeah. business cards. If you need anything, if okay. you need liner notes, yeah. if you need things like this, he does it for musicians from the, his heart. Wow. Because he just believes in promote. He loves music. He yeah. does this whole thing for veterans. We're going to have you do a PSA for veterans mm -hmm. if you Absolutely. want to give you a hat. Absolutely. Um, he's just wonderful. So those of you who are out there, I believe in supporting wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And he will support you back. And so if you need anything printed, they are the nicest people. They do excellent work. And why not deal with nice people who are good people? Right. Rick Smokey, Quick Impressions of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I also want to give a shout out to my hairdresser, Nicole Vanables, who I just got coiffed last week. I nice. Just, yes, very blonde. I'm very blonde. And her hairspray is fuck off. <laughs> and you got to love somebody with a sense of humor. Right now, she's as, she's at the final, they're doing the final taping of Will and Grace. She's nice. Megan Mullally's hairdresser. Uh -huh. and, Anyway, love you, Nicole. And I also want to give a shout out to that mentor, Anson Williams, who has Alert Drops. Do you know about this? No. Okay, this is a brilliant thing. Mm -hmm. His uncle was Heim is Heimlich. Mm -hmm. The Heimlich maneuver? Yeah. And so they created Alert Drops, and it's purely organic. So it's label. made from, from lemon uh, rinds. Mm -hmm. And they created it so that truck drivers, pilots and everything, when they were starting to fall asleep, mm -hmm. you do a couple of hits of it, you spray, right. and it wakes you up. Wow. And it's all natural. Nice. And so, and it works when you're on a really boring day at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and you need to get home, just <laughs> out. It works, it did. So anyway, so those are wonderful people. True story. And, um, yeah, true story. So now let's talk about another wonderful person. Yeah. So I want, I want to... I, I don't know I don't want to talk about her until she, I don't want to talk about her in front of her face behind her back. I want to bring her out, but I want to introduce her musically since you are musically together. Yeah. So let's get you and Melanie to do a song together. Yes. And then we'll talk to Melanie. So Melanie Taylor. Yes. Yay. Yay. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of here. Melanie's gonna come and and, and sing with um, Melanie Taylor. Yeah, come come around. Okay. Um, and for right now you take my place because I'm gonna get out of here while you guys sing. Okay. And uh. Yeah, hey, baby. Look at this Happy gorgeous holidays. woman. Happy holidays. Hello. Okay. Hi, Faith. You have to see her shoes. Can you hold them up? I don't know how you can <laughs> do this. The yeah, I love the shot. This the shoes I mean. Okay. Like yeah, look reverse. how fab. Can you see that? They're even... fabulous. Wait, turn them sideways. Oh, it's I see. It's... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. delay. Yeah, yeah. there's a delay. Okay. So this is my wife, Melanie Taylor. Yay! <laughs> and we'll get into everything Melanie yeah. well, does. Right. Yeah. Happy to be here. Harlette! Oh, I was. Yes. Well, you know, once a Harlette, always a Harlette. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is a song. This is a song I wrote. Uh, like to hear it. Here it comes. Okay. A song I wrote uh, a few years ago with a friend of mine. Okay. <laughs> Baby! 
My mom's a country pianist, Ooh, and my yeah. dad uh, sang. Okay. And, and what kind of what kind of music? My dad op- was an opera singer. You know, okay, like, well, where did you grow classical. up? Mm-hmm. I was born and raised in New Orleans. Ooh, yeah. yeah. City, city <laughs> music. It's, it's a beautiful place to, mm-hmm. to come up. It's magical. It's like the only place where I feel like voodoo and Catholicism like can coexist <laughs> in the same block. You know what I mean? <laughs> so kind of anything goes. They call it the Big Easy for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I grew up there with my great grandparents and my grandparents and my mother. You know, like. Just and you sing all time. the time? No, I was dancing. Oh. <laughs> I came up as a dancer. That's why I can't play an instrument. Like I never. I, I, my first gig, I was six years old. I danced mm-hmm. at my first gig. Yeah, I danced true. the Arabian Nights. It's true. It's I like, was, you know, cleaning up dog poop. <laughs> no, I didn't get paid. Making yeah, my dad. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. well, I just, I just came to it naturally. I, I think as just like a show pony, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I still have my first costume. My yeah. grandma made it by hand. I know. I know. I need to put it in a little shadow box or yeah. something. Anyway, fast forward to just growing up, um, being a creative kid. You mm-hmm. know, I played viola and I was... It you so you did play an instrument badly though. <laughs> <laughs> like the and it, it never stuck, yeah. you know. So, but I danced and you know, like a little bit competitively and stuff all through mm. uh, like grade school. I wrote a lot. First thing I ever won was a prize for creative writing. Nice. What kind of writing? I mean, I mean what, what, what did you write? Like prose and little little mm-hmm. stories and mm-hmm. poetry. I've always written poetry. And I, I have this little observational group stories. Right. I've heard of that. <laughs> so I think I made a post the other day. <laughs> yeah. I need to get, I need to get, I'd love to get more involved. Mm-hmm. I really would because mm-hmm. I am writing a book. Mm-hmm. But that's a sidebar. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so all going through school I sang, but I didn't know I could sing. You know what I mean? It was like, I just did it because I, it was something like, you know, my whole family sings. You didn't study it? No. Wow. I didn't study voice until I lost my voice. What was that about? Well, I was at Dis- I was uh, once again fast forward to like I was uh, at Tokyo Disneyland for nine months singing with a band, a great band. Um, yeah. Well, so you knew you could sing. You were well by that did. time I did. Okay. Yeah, this is we're leaving out like a huge chunk of my life story. I have a degree in dance and musical theater. And theater. So I've sung my whole life, but it was never a vocation. It was never like oh, I'm a singer. I'm going so to be that. So you were an act. You were an actress who sang and dancer. And I was dancer. a dancer. I have, a, I, have, yeah, I have a degree in dance and act. You know, I study music. Where did you go to school? Cal State Fullerton. All right. It's a great school. Beautiful program. Mm. So um, where was I? So yeah. So uh, my, my favorite story about me singing mm-hmm. and, and and becoming into that idea that that was actually something that I could do and like someone would pay me. Because um, I, I was in concert, choir, madrigals, all that kind of stuff in high school and mm-hmm. stuff. So anyway, um, I was... Wait, yeah. first musical theater yeah. uh-huh. role, what was it? Oh, Nikki and Sweet Charity. Nice. Yeah. See, well, that's the difference, because I was a teapot. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was a Hanukkah candle. Okay. I swear to God. All right. I love it. That sounds like it could have been fun, though. It was a blast. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Paula Kelly idolized her, so to, to dance that role was really kind of kind of a thrill, you know? Mm-hmm. And we did have a great program. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was I was singing theater, you know, so it was loud. I mean, I was singing without mic. Right, so I right. got a call from a friend of mine who had a little, little duo, uh, you know, club. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy named Gary. Thanks, Gary, for doing that for me. Mm-hmm. Because he really, it was just, I, I owe it all to him. Um, he called me one day and was like, hey, I wrote this song, I'm a songwriter, but, you know, I don't sing, so would you come do a demo for me? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. What does that wow. mean? He goes, well, I just need a female singer to sing the song. And I was like, oh, all right, whatever. Mm-hmm. I go to the house, and I was, it was like a scandal, Patty Smythe, if you remember her. Yeah. Yeah, lose, uh, uh, the song I sang was called Lose Your Love, but it was like that big rock kind of vocal, mm-hmm. so I was just like, Belting on the microphone, he was like, "Yo, hang on a second, let me, <laughs> let me help you." Is what he said, and he taught me how to sing on a mic. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, I really didn't know, and so we did the thing. He was happy with it. I probably still have it on cassette. Somewhere. I noticed when you were singing with Terry that you you knew when to pull that mic away. Yeah, you, know, it, yeah, you don't yeah. want to you don't want to scare people and mm-hmm. it, blow your whole show. <laughs> get a little too loud. I, I get a little too loud. We're all a little too loud. Time. <laughs> <laughs> but we love it. <laughs> so, um, long story short, he paid me, and mm-hmm. I was like. <laughs> you can make money doing this. Wow. And I never looked back. Wow. That was it. Okay, so then, what was the first gig? Um, probably after that, after I graduated from school, I auditioned and got cast out uh, singing and dancing at Disneyland. I was a kid of the kingdom for a long time. Wow. Uh, and we, and was we, that fun? Oh, my God. That was one of the best times of my life, for was sure. Was it really? Yeah, because I went straight from school to mm-hmm. having a gig doing the thing I'd been trained to do. Like, when does that never happen? Yeah, that's fantastic. I felt so fortunate, mm-hmm. you know, and um, met lifelong friends, of course. Mm-hmm. We're also mm-hmm. friends to this day. Mm-hmm. And just got to work in the park every day, mm-hmm. singing and dancing and doing shows with the most brilliant uh, choreographers ah. and directors. Barnett Ritchie, shout out. 
she was she is brilliant she mm -hmm. was um she was such a visionary mm -hmm. so i did that for a really mm -hmm. long time and then just kind of stayed i worked at disney a, a long time and did the kids thing mm -hmm. then sang with bands went to tokyo for how, almost how long a year. did you work at disney oh about 10 years oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah for sure and went to dis uh, we asked about studying voice and i, I want to say something about that because um, I never did until I lost my voice. Like, you don't know what you have to lose. Okay, so how did you lose your voice? I was singing without technique, and, and you know, I got a soft node on one of my, one of my mm. chords. And that's because I, I, can't, oh, I can't do it now, but I sound like a cheerleader, like a Demi Moore, kind of like really mm -hmm. raspy, but the rasp is a, it's cute, but it never goes away. Mm -hmm. And then your range, of course, is limited because you have this little thing. So I went and got scoped um, by Dr. Morton Cooper mm -hmm. and um, went and found a voice teacher, a great, great coach who really coached me back to health. Go ahead, shout out. Um, thanks to uh, Eric Futerer mm -hmm. and Andy Bettner. Mm -hmm. And I still study uh, whenever I can, which isn't that often, but my uh, coach is called uh, Kate Peters. Kate Peters, Kate Peters is who I'm studying with now, too. Are you? She saved my voice, too. Yeah. When, when I was yeah. in Vegas since uh, recently, you know, the past 10 years, and losing my voice, getting triple sinus infections and ear infections and stuff. I'm going to bring up touring and traveling because it's, it's <clears> you know, <throat> 5 a.m. lobby calls and, you know, getting on a bus at 1 in the Just, morning. Yeah, and climate changes in York. It wears yeah. your voice out. Yeah, it's Absolutely. exhausting. That's yeah. why I, I, mean, I avoid the phone whenever possible, and that's mm -hmm. the truth. If, if I'm working, if I'm working a lot, if I have a week where I have a lot of sessions and gigs, I just try to balance it all out, you know what I mean? I had to go to a voice therapist because I, I mm -hmm. got, uh, I, I went on the master cleanse and it's uh, all hot mm. pepper and lemon and oh, pepper and my thing. Hello. I got like a, nod, a, a nodule and uh -huh. so I had to go to a therapist to like relearn how to speak That's properly. Right. And yeah. the first thing he said to me was, don't talk in the car. Don't talk oh. on the phone in the car. Because, because, you're, because you're, right. you're projecting. That's right. You're like, and of course, do I listen to him? I do it every day. <laughs> every day of my life, I'm talking on the phone. It's like your second <laughs> office, isn't it? Of course. I know. When did you make your calls? When did you drop us off? You don't want to be doing We could be home well, chilling. And I'm wasting time if I'm in the car and not doing anything. I'm wasting time you're going somewhere. sitting in your car. I know. It's, it's another office for sure. Okay, so how did Had Ben Miller happen? Yeah. Oh, my oh, God. Hi, oh, my friend Jerry Lynn. I know half people I'm mentioning aren't watching, but you know, you're in my my heart. My friend was like, you have to go try out Bette Midler's Looking for Harlots, and I was like, okay, what year is this? I don't know, 1993. <laughs> so like, she's like, at the height. Well, she like, had taken like 10 years off to go those to, have, to get married, have Sophie, right. baby, and then do all those Disney movies, Reckless, mm -hmm. or Ruthless People, and this and that. She did like a bunch of movies for Disney, right? And took some time off from touring. Right, but she had like that huge, she had a huge presence in the 90s. She was oh, so, right. yeah. but that was a thing. So oh, like, okay. right, it, 1993, she decides she's going back down the road. She, you know, she needs to put a band together and or whatnot. And uh, I was, of course, working, uh, you know, singing, singing. I was, I, I was singing at Disney at the time, uh -huh. off and on with this band. I was like, my friend Jerry went, oh, you know, you really, this is perfect for you. You really should go. I'm like, are you, I don't feel, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't know. You know, like what happened. She's like, you really should go. <laughs> Especially with the theatrical background. Yeah. yeah. Little did I know, <laughs> it turns out I was perfect for the job. Yeah. But All I your went. Skill sets. I yeah, know, right? I yeah. went and I, I just was like, I don't even know what I want to sing. And I sang a little few bars of Natural Woman. No big deal. Like, it was just something. Wait, give, can you give us a little oh, bit? Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, come on. I don't know what key. Looking out upon the morning rain. See? I used to feel so uninspired. <laughs> and when I knew I had to face another day, oh, yeah, it made me feel so tired. Because we're always tired, don't we? <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's nice. So, okay, so you, you sang for Bet, or did you sing for Not people? at that time. Well, you sing for, you know, you just do a video, and then they start sending it around to her. And there's different people. 500 women later, they, she chose three of us. Wow. Oh, it was my like, God. It was a nationwide call. And we, wow. and I had, we had six callbacks. Wow. So the sixth, the sixth callback, I was like, they don't hire me. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not coming back. <laughs> I have done everything. We sang, we danced, we did these wow. little skits. Oh, you we did. Did. oh my God, it was, it was like, it was, a, it was like taking class. Like we'd go, we'd turn up and sing and, and then they'd match you up in different groups. And mm -hmm. she was very, very- It's also, if you had to do a chemistry thing, I'm sure right. that you all had and to- choreography. The look, yeah. the chemistry, she was like, your face, she loved our faces together. Big round eyes and just, you know. Did you do it with she, that's what she who, told us. who was another Harlem? Brianne Terrio mm -hmm. and um, Carol Hatchett. Okay, mm -hmm. and very so talented you, women. Are you guys still friends? Did, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. we see each other whenever, you know, we don't see each other a lot. But, right. but the Harlots are a big sisterhood. There's mm -hmm. probably, I think at this point, there's 
maybe 30 of us. I know Katie Since Stahl she started, was one. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Melissa, Melissa Katie, Manchester. Luther mm-hmm. Vandross was an Luther. honorary harlot. Yeah. He was. He was wow. on the, yeah, the at the beginning when they before she integrated all the dance and the mm-hmm. comedy and stuff. Charlotte Crosley, who I'm really good friends mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Uh, Franny, Mc, um, uh, uh, Linda Hart, who you know mm-hmm. went on to do great things mm-hmm. as an actor. And my and currently uh, the last gals were uh, Camila Marshall, who's a really good friend. I'm gonna leave somebody else. I probably mm-hmm. shouldn't start. Nicolette Hart, <laughs> and I'm gonna forget the third gal. And she's fantastic. Anyway, they're all. Everyone's doing great. That's so fun. We all. We all. And so, them. how was that? What was that experience like? <laughs> Tell us a vet story. It was Tell a little a... bit of everything. Okay. Um, how is Beth to work with? She's so focused. Mm. She's so focused, and she's she's funny, but you know. She's serious. Ha- she's really serious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Risa, it takes a lot of seriousness to be funny. To be that funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My fa- One of my favorite. I, let me turn, oh, I, I have a story. Yeah. Okay, good. I have a lot of them, but I had to think of something. I'm mm-hmm. like not really. I'm, I'm not really prepared. One night we were going, getting ready to go on. We did six sold out weeks at Radio City Music Hall. When you were asking about his most hot, hit, one mm-hmm. of his high mm-hmm. points that for sure right. that was my my mother was in the mm-hmm. audience on opening night and wow. oh. it was really something you know and every night you'd look out and there'd be like people like Prince and Diana oh. Ross and Donald oh. Sutherland like all these people everyone came to see her everyone oh. everyone came yeah of course well one night I don't know if it was it probably wasn't ready to see but one night we were getting ready she was getting ready to go on and she'd always have um, her papers you know with mm-hmm. with the dialogue and every every city that we went to she'd tailor the dialogue. To the city, or sometimes she, wow. you know, she she call out. Did a, she have writers? Bruce Valanche. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, Bruce, Bruce is going to be on the show. He I is. love Bruce. We yeah, love Bruce. Nobody better than Bruce. Nobody better. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. what what a, just to sit with him and just you know what, hear his process and talk to him. He was, mm-hmm. And he's a lovely, lovely man. Mm-hmm. He's, he's such a good friend of ours. But anyway, so one night she was getting ready. We were getting ready to go on. I'm just standing stage left, and she was looking at her papers. And, and I, and I you should never really say this to somebody before they go on. So how's it going? They're like, how you doing? How you feeling? Like, don't ask that question, y'all. Don't ever say that. Don't say, you, don't ever say, are you having fun? Don't ask that question. I'm just trying to help you. Um, so of course I said so. I mean, but it was kind of weird. Like, eh, how's it going? She goes, I'm fine. I'm just trying to work myself up into a snip. That's all. And I was like, that's the magic. That's the id factor that she has. It. She becomes this character kind of. You know, she becomes this woman. She accesses this incredible, powerful, strong, fierce, kind of snippy little, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. Because she's not, she's like that, but she's not, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's just another, it's just another pumped up part of who she Mm -hmm. is. And I just laughed at that. It was hilarious. Mm -hmm. I think I still have those papers. Wow. But she kind of didn't want them. I was like, oh. (laughs) Sorry, Ben, if you're watching. (laughs) I still have them. (laughs) No one's ever seen them, just me. Wow. So yeah, there's a million stories, of course. I did it for almost 10 years. Wow. That's great. Great, great, great. Uh, favorite concert with that was Radio City. <clears throat> Radio City for sure. Also um, on the Divine Miss Millennium mm-hmm. tour, which was the last one we did with her, was it sort of the turn of the century. Remember, we thought <laughs> it was gonna <laughs> wow. Y2K. Y2K right. We were in Vegas for Y2K, and I thought, well, if there's any place to go down in flames, this is the place. <laughs> so, um, so we we had a really great show for her uh, at the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we did. Um, we were in Rolling Stone. That was not a concert, but that was a moment. Wow, that's a moment. We were in yeah. the Millennium you, were you, on, you weren't on the cover of Rolling Stone? We, we, we were going to do the cover, and then they ended up doing a, a collage on the uh, cover. Uh-huh. I still have a few of them. But it, we're in the middle, like yeah. kind of a centerfold. It's a Ooh, big spread. It's yeah. a big spread. I mean, that's a spread in a centerfold. <laughs> <laughs> that's, nice. Those are not words you don't wow. want. Those are words you don't want to tell your mother. Right. <laughs> <laughs> These are the jokes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, yeah, so and then career highlights post-bet? Probably making my records. Mm. You know, uh, getting to make my records with Terry. And with yeah, we yeah. record together. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been one. Melanie's got a Christmas record out, and then <clears throat> uh, an album called "The Road I'm On." Mm-hmm. That's really very, very cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, what's the Christmas album? Because it's just the season. I know it's right. the season. Um, it's it's just uh, it's called "This Christmas," and I did it uh, about oh, a long time ago. But it's but it's it's, it's, it's all, Christmas. It's this Christmas. Yeah. I do River and this Christmas, the Donny Hathaway tune. I do River, the Johnny Mitchell tune, uh, Breath of Heaven, a beautiful Amy Grant song, mm-hmm. um, and a couple others. Uh, Have yourself a merry little Christmas. So we had a really good time doing it um, a few years ago, and uh, I probably it's probably on CD Baby. I think they might still have a couple. Mm-hmm. I love that. And let's don't, hold hold it. don't hold me yeah. to it. Don't hold me to it. This one is fantastic too. I think I have a I joyful think, noise. Have, Terry's Christmas. I um, do. I do a track on here. I yes. see. Yeah. Some children see him. 
which is a gorgeous. I don't know it, but you're gonna sing something uh, for us pretty. before we go. It's, Am I? It's oh, and one more thing that you can get for Jumas is oh, yeah. John Jones' <laughs> next to rock and roll and my fucking mother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which it's great. Right. Uh, hilarious. You did? Yeah, you gave us one. Yeah, we've heard oh, this I, one. Oh, oh, you didn't even tell me. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. I was hoping you had another bunch of your message. I need a stack of stuff. I'll get a stack of stuff. Okay. All right. So, so, we, so we, to celebrate this album, yeah. like the tradition started when the album came out. I think this is our eighth annual Christmas show. We do uh, a show every year. Where? At Spagatini in Seal Beach, California. Yeah. Uh, Melanie will be singing. And when is that? Sunday. It, oh, this Sunday. This Sunday, okay. December 22nd. There's still a few seats up front. And it's become a really great tradition. I mean, oh, people come back every year and celebrate with us, and it's really... Is great. it all Christmas songs? No, I do some of my mm -hmm. instrumental mm -hmm. hits and things like that as well. And mm -hmm. and we, we throw in a few R&B things once in a while. Or we, I always kind of mix it up and mm -hmm. do the regular uh, Christmas songs as well. So yeah. it's, it's really fun. Well, um, yeah. I've had a lot of fun. Ron, wow. thank you so thank much, Ron Frederick, for being it's, back there. And, thank you, Ron. And, it's uh, been amazing <laughs> hearing you. So, so before really. we go, I want you guys to, to take us out with some music. Um, think about what you want to do. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I'm going to talk before you, uh, before you do this. So next week is Christmas. So it's actually on the show. is it, It's Christmas Day. So I can't make any I can't ask anybody. And first day of Hanukkah. Uh, no, the first day of Hanukkah is a couple Sunday. days before. Yeah. No, that's when we're doing it. It's oh, you're doing it. Oh, the first day of Hanukkah is when you're doing your show. Yeah, right. I thought you meant Christmas was the first day of Hanukkah. I'm talking no, about Christmas I'm now. Sorry. I've moved on to it. <laughs> I'm stuck on me. It's the first day of Hanukkah. Back to me. Do you do a Hanukkah song? No. What? I, no, I, I might have a little surprise this year. Okay, then. I'm working on it. So, um, but I'll be back next Wednesday um, on Christmas because Harry is going to be working weird hours so we're gonna have a weird christmas so i'm gonna be here at seven o'clock next wednesday hey. with you guys just me i'm gonna turn the camera on run around and sit and have a little chat with you and then the following week is new year's and and so it's Crazy. new year's day so pete george will be back and we'll be here for you it's and my birthday is it that's right because yeah. i had asked her to do that day and he said it was your birthday yeah that's right. he's a good husband we'll be eating yeah. all day so that's yeah that's all i want to do my birthday I that. He's the best time. So that's you. pretty wonderful. So anyway, we'll be back on the first, and then on uh, January eighth, James Gadsden, who oh, like the God. drummer of drummers yeah, of the drummers, so magnificent. I, I was just in touch with Leland Sklar. He's going to be with us soon. Mm -hmm. um, just incredible people are coming up. So mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. Donna Pescal said yes. Yeah. So Donna Pescal, she's from. Oh, oh my hello. God. So well, yeah, it's going to yeah, be goodness. wonderful stuff coming up. And on January twenty eighth, to make up for the women who ride that I. This week, uh, <laughs> on right. January twenty eighth, uh, Donnie Most from Happy Days will be singing jazz. He's a he does great he's jazz. Fantastic. He's fantastic. He's going to be mm -hmm. um, and Lauren Cole, the keyboard player of the Who, will be playing with wow. him. I did a session with him today. Promise to That's us. Right. Stop. I promise. I, Lauren was supposed to be here yesterday. <laughs> oh, I love you, Lauren. There's <laughs> photographic evidence on the face. He was supposed to be playing with Eastern Morales, who was flying in from Utah on a special flight to get here, and I fucked the whole thing up. Oh my but God. Lauren will be back. And oh, then Snuffy and Sarah will be here yeah, um, on awesome. the 28th. Yeah. And Adam Chester, who is yeah. uh, Elton, John's, yeah. Elton John's guy. I've yeah. played with Adam. He's a blast. Uh, okay, so it's going to be an unbelievable show. Yeah. Maybe you guys can come. It's going to be unbelievable on, on the 28th. Yep, so, okay, so you guys are going to take us out with some song. I don't know. I, I, oh, was, not, I don't okay. even know. He doesn't he tell me. All right, what do you, what do you want? Can you write where you are? Oh, uh, okay. No. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because you're right yeah. here. Yeah. So, oh, so we're, I'm going to say goodbye to you sorry, now. We will see you. I'll see you next week on Christmas. Mm -hmm. I know you want to spend your Christmas with me. Why not? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for doing Can this. Can I do a very quick plug? Yeah. If anybody wants to know anything more about Melanie, it's MelanieTaylorArtist.com. Perfect. For me, TerryWallman.com. And my podcast. Please. Making It With Terry Wallman. You can find it on iTunes. You can find it. Go to my website. You can link to there or entertalkmedia.com. I'm on Instagram. I prefer yes. the real Melanie Taylor. Because <laughs> that's where I spend most of my time. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Because I have nothing else to do. I'm a Facebook person. Okay, but. cool. This is a song uh, that's on uh, one of my records. Here. No, you don't have to. No, no you stay. I'm, no, I'm going. She's I'm out. going. You're in yeah. uh, you give a cup of coffee. She's that out. I wrote with Melissa Manchester and, and Lori Barth. And Melanie sang. Melissa asked Melanie to sing it and How about that? on the record. So. I love that. It's pretty awesome being produced mm. by her. So. My friend Jeff Gellis from back in my rock and roll days is watching. Hi, Jeff. He's a great bass player. Blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, you need
need to be louder. We need melody. I'm hearing your voice. Whoa. All things matter. Yeah. What would you pray for?